Welcome to Above the Garage. Hi, friends. Welcome to our discussion of Season 1, Episode 5 of The Crowded Room. Let's do our round of introductions and then dive in. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, I'm Yulia. Hi, I'm Kimberly. And I'm Kate. This episode is entitled Savior. It was written by Akiva Goldsman and directed by Cornell Mundrupso. Just another disclaimer that when Apple generously sent us the screeners so we could prep our episodes before the show dropped, they also sent us a detailed list of topics we could not discuss until certain episodes. So our conversation reflects that where we have to maybe not discuss certain things we would normally be discussing, as obviously we want to respect the creator's wishes. In later episodes, we can explore these topics in greater detail and reflect on our thoughts from earlier episodes that we couldn't share. But on with the episode. When the episode opens, we get to see a bit more of the interrogation room as Raya brings in her coffee. There's a desk across the room. Have we seen her at that desk before and assumed it was her office? Because it kind of seemed like the way the camera work was shot, that it was a a reveal of some sort, you know? That was my first thought until they like brought in the shot and you could see the table that Danny was sitting at. Right. Like my first thought was, ooh, this is her office. And then I think it's the same room, but just from a different angle. Right. Yeah. So like I always assumed that it's some kind of interrogation room before, but now since she has like a desk in the room, she's interviewing him. It kind of changes her role a bit, I think. For me, at least, like it it makes me question what kind of interview this is now. So it's not like, you know, like the common fugitive Mm -hmm. interrogation room after. (laughs) Yeah, it's not like in a police station. And we kind of saw that, too, when she walked down the hall in the end of the last episode. Yeah. Also, it's weird how she interviews him because, like, it's not like they... He killed anyone, and he, uh, you know what I mean? Like at Rockefeller Center, like people would just show. Like it's not like he's a mass murderer or something, and she's interviewing him. Like it's a very detailed interview. Right. And it's going on for days. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that, Kimberly, because that gives me a segue. Because I uh, kept thinking about what we were saying before about how the chief, the law enforcement, whoever we're calling him, he really wants Danny to be a serial killer. And um, I, Remember that that time period in New York, people were hyper aware of of that because of Son of Sam. Son of Sam had just happened in New York City, July 1976 to July 1977. And this takes place in 1979. So I'm thinking like, there was a lot of focus on that in New York City. And I think I don't know about that. I'm wondering if he wants like a feather in his cap like that in his career, you know, like um, whoever works on a big case like that gets a lot of notoriety. So um, I started, you know, wondering about things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got the same feeling kind of that the police officer chief or detective is really pushing the serial killer narrative when it comes to Danny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also makes you wonder if, you know, she's excited, like, she seems very motivated to do this questioning, you know, detailed questioning. So mm-hmm. just same kind of impression from her as well. Her angle is different, though. Like she's she's really more interested in Danny himself and getting to the bottom of what's going on with Danny. Right. Not just what he's guilty of. Right. But I, I just feel like there's some professional interest as well from her. Mm-hmm. That's more than a, a typical case. Right. Anyway, Danny's back, so we don't get to see further questioning of Jack, sadly, at least not yet. And Raya's telling Danny it's okay, that this is going to be a process, and asks him to go further back in the story, in his story, to tell her some happy memories from his childhood. And he's remembering Danny and Adam, and they're going over baseball stats, being adorable. Adam is sure that this is their year. Adam's about to go to London, and Danny promises to cheer their team on while they're gone. Apparently, the dad picks the kids up and takes them to London at separate times, so Danny's turn will be at Christmas. That would be a sad arrangement for the kids, but also mentioned is that Danny says his mom always said that they were attached at the hip. Raya establishes that this was going to be the first time that they'd been apart, and Danny was extra sad because Adam was his protector, it seems. Always had his back. This seems like a common theme of the show, that someone's always popping up to help him out. Mm -hmm. Right. And, like, that's the title of the episode is Savior, and he uses that word a lot in this episode. He was my savior. So with Adam gone, he immediately gets bullied by a kid at the bake sale. The kid not only borrows his money, but hits his cookie out of his hand before Danny reacts by throwing some big goods to the floor. And he gets called to the office for that, where there's a guidance counselor and the principal waiting for him. Principal says he couldn't get in touch with Danny's mom and then starts to say something about the dad, but stops himself, just implying that that's why the guidance counselor is here, perhaps in large part because of his troubles at home. 
And the guidance counselor is very sympathetic and nice. That kid that was mean to him was Bill, right? The one from... Oh, he's later. He's the older kid that picks on him. I didn't realize that it was the same kid. Oh, yeah. it's the same Bill. You know what? When I was watching it, I was like, that sounds familiar, but I couldn't place it at the time. So thank you. Yeah. I caught the name. I was like, oh, man, Bill's always been a... <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, always, always a bully. It's very annoying to have a lifetime bully. Yeah. Very Back to the Future-esque. Yeah. (laughs) The name is also similar, Biff and Bill. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The guidance counselor was really nice. He he seemed to be letting him off easy, whereas the principal was not wanting to give him as much of a break as the guidance counselor. Now, the guidance counselor is not the same guy as later in the episode, is he? Oh, really? Okay, that was the comment I was going to make because I thought it was the same guy. He looks the same. I think mm-hmm. it is, babe. I think yeah, it is. Yeah, I think it's the same guy. I, it looked like like later on in the classroom scene, I was like, uh, is that the same guy as was the guidance counselor earlier on? But I... I'll quickly go and have a look. Okay. But like in our schools, we have a dedicated guidance counselor. He doesn't double his... A teacher or anything yeah but it would make sense because he's being so sympathetic to him here and then obviously what we see later that's shitty it is the same guy he's substituting for the teacher the board says oh okay oh. got it that does add an extra layer of creepy because he knows his like yeah uh, home life and his home situation yeah yeah he knows he's acting up he's troubled Ugh. it sucks that there's not a single person you know that actually is he can trust. Right. Adult. Maybe his mom. Mm, maybe. I don't know. I kind of get the impression through his like memories of her that he's over idealizing her. Yeah. You know, which you would do. I mean, obviously you want your mom to be amazing, especially when everybody else sucks, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, then Danny's walking home from school through the other kids playing idyllically in the street. And he gets home and shockingly fails to mention the bake sale incident to his mom. They talk about the ghost house. The family living there is moving out. And he prophetically asks, who's going to live there now? Ghost, she says, before she got, she's got she got to run and change from her nurse outfit to her next job outfit. The kid lights her cigarette for her because this is the 70s after all. <laughs> and they have a cute little forehead touch. Mm-hmm. He begs her to let him go to work with her because he hates being alone. She refuses for a while, but she finally gives in and lets him pick out her dress for tonight. Back in the interrogation room, Raya tells Danny she talked to his mom and he's quite surprised and excited. His excitement is contagious and Raya has this huge, like, genuine smile as she tells him that his mom wants to come visit. In driving their convertible to work, Danny drops the note from his principal into the wind and Mumsy doesn't push him on the littering or what it is that he just threw away. They just enjoy the wind in their hair as they fly down the road. Another kind of ideal memory. Yeah. I had a couple of comments about the scene where she's getting ready. Like, did it strike anyone else as a strange mother-son moment when she's like sitting the on underwear. the floor in her underwear and he lights a cigarette? for her mm-hmm. yeah that did yeah. Um, strike me as something i would not do with my children it seemed very normal for them yeah and the other thing before she takes him into work with her was the alternative she was going to leave him alone was that another normal thing for them yeah yeah and i also think that that was a normal thing for the times i don't know like my parents left us alone a lot latchkey kids and yeah yeah and she, you know she's from a standpoint of what are she probably can't afford to pay a babysitter every single night she has no option right i mean otherwise you know her she's she's having a hard time making ends meet as it is with two jobs so yeah. putting that money towards watching him while she goes to make money it's like it's uh, she can't get on top of anything there'd be no point yeah i'd say she has no choice there's no way that she can right. do anything but leave him home alone. But it does suck for him. But how old is he supposed to be in this pr- part of the timeline? Do we know? Oh, I actually, the scene I just rewatched, he said he's our elementary school counselor. So I would guess him to be like 10 because you leave elementary school around 11 or. Okay. So yeah, I would think 9, 10. Yeah. yeah probably. Okay. And really, I think the legal age to leave a kid alone is like 12. At least it was when I was a kid. Right. <laughs> I don't know if it still is. My daughter's around that age and like only now, like now parents are having conversations like, do you leave your kid at home for like an errand and things like that. So Mm -hmm. even in this day and age, but obviously um, a whole night is a different situation. Again, uh, it's just all she can do. If she's unable to, if she has to work this much to try and catch up with the bills, she's, there's no option for her. And that really sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also explains later the appeal of, um, Marlon? Marlon. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, 
a stable guy with a good job and right a savior and you know at least in the beginning it seemed like a good option he was good to her and the you know so it's it's like it, it definitely explains why this kind of solves a lot of her life problems if right if she doesn't know it still seems perfect but mm-hmm. i think at some point you know as a mom you know but i guess we'll find out and yep. hope i'm wrong Anyway, the second they walk through the door at the bar, her boss is objecting loudly about Danny's presence. She ignores him and sets Danny up with crayons, tells him to count to 10 before he starts his favorite song on the jukebox, before she goes over to argue with the boss. And he softens and offers him a burger and a soda. It becomes apparent that this happens a lot and is not, in fact, a one-off. I thought that was cute. Yeah, it was. He was actually like, yeah, he was nice after his initial reaction. Mm-hmm. I didn't quite follow the 10 second jukebox thing, but it was the guy's favorite song. It's how they oh, it him into, um, yeah, getting him to stay. I gotcha. That's really funny. And it showed he's um, comfortable. Like he just walked right up to the jukebox and right. played the song. He'd done this before. Yeah. Later that night at the bar, the bar folk are being racist assholes when four African Americans walk in. One of the men is talking with Danny about dinosaurs, being super nice with him when he gets accosted by some douchebag from the pool tables, and the guy starts beating the shit out of him for no reason. In the interrogation, Danny reveals this was a major event in his life, he thinks. He thinks the blood that night marked him. He says blood spilled in violence has magical powers. It can ward off evil or it can summon it. As he has snippets of flashbacks and tells her that everything that happened afterwards couldn't just be a coincidence. It's wild that he's blaming it all on this seemingly random incident you know right that has nothing to do with him well and it got i think there's a mention it gets bloody or whatever but i don't think we're we're told how bad it i looked like it was like a full bar fight like it wasn't just the two dudes like it expanded to right like, a larger fight other people join joining in and his mom was like shielding danny protect trying to protect him yeah it's just so interesting to me that he focuses on this as the cause for like the rest of his life whereas something absolutely terrible is about to happen to him yeah but i guess it was just the timing of and he really does Mm -hmm. seem to blame himself like like there's like it because that man was talking to him and being nice to him is what caused the asshole to intervene or I think the asshole would have been an asshole no matter what had happened yeah, with Danny. I think so. Obviously. Sure, it had nothing to do with Danny. He, they, he wasn't happy with them being there. And that would have happened regardless. When they walked through the door, he decided he was going to fight him. Right. Mm-hmm. So that yeah. had nothing to do with Danny. But Are we supposed to be in the 60s now? The time with the interrogation, I thought, was 79. So I guess we're like in 70, 71 or something. Right. Early 70s. Because I was just wondering, like, where do, where do they live, by the way? Like, for some reason, I thought it was New York because they're in New York uh-huh. when he's living in the ghost house. But but when Ariana goes out, I thought she was in New York. Right. But let me let me introduce one more piece of evidence to confuse you. They're talking about the Cubs as a competitor and there's no New York. There's no New York team in the Cubs division. So. Mm-hmm. But they're definitely they're in New York when the when the shooting happens because they're at Rockefeller Center. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. And there's been shots of the Twin Towers that have given me chills. Yeah, mm. I think they're just in New York. Yeah. I was mainly asking because everyone stared at Black people walking in. So I was just like, yeah, are they in? Yeah, that was surprising too. This is like segregation style. Like, you don't belong in the same bar as me. I mean, I think it's... But it wasn't like like 60s, late 60s, early 70s it would have been. Segregation ended like in the 60s. Yeah, yeah that's that's what I noticed, especially when they like everyone kind of looked like, oh, what are you doing here? Like, I really find it odd that in New York City at that time, it would have been that extreme of a reaction unless it's just one of those places that's mm. a well-known racist like bar you know i know jim crow laws were mostly in the south but it's not that far removed from that time period yeah, that's why i asked like where is it because i don't know about america but i should, what i kind of know is that obviously in the south are more like right racist yep. you mm-hmm. know what i mean like lower to uh progress yes yeah accurate impression all right Young Daddy is even struggling to sleep, thinking about the fight that night, so Mom lets him sleep in her bed. In the interrogation, Daddy says she was always looking for a savior to make things better for them. And then we see flashback Marlon pulling into what looks like a juvenile detention center. He seems like a great guy from our initial impression with him. He's advising a new inmate on the best way to get in and out of there in the six months. Trust Marlon and he'll take care of him. Watch out for him because the kid's small and he's going to get tested. He's... In there for breaking and entering in his grandmother's house. That's not really explained. And unfortunately, his birthday was the day before today, which is the only reason he was the right age for this place. 
Yeah, so uh, I was just thinking that was so like so unfortunate. Yeah, all of it pretty awful. Um, and on his way out the door, Marlon notices the kid's hesitation and calls him back in so the kid can hand him the blade he's got stored in his mouth. Nice. The point is, the kid trusts him. He seems like a nice guy, you know. Yeah, I was expecting something to happen. And then when I didn't, I was right. like, maybe I've got the wrong impression of him. Like, I had that feeling a couple different times, and <laughs> but then I was wrong. <laughs> exactly. Same, yeah. And I was very impressed with the kid having the shiv in his mouth and not like fumbling his words. I was like, bro. He talked, yeah. If I had had that in my mouth, I would have been like <laughs> shitting bricks. There would have been like blood pouring out of your mouth. Right. I get, it would have had something on the edges though, because there's no way you could have ha- just put that in your mouth without your gums bleeding. It would have had to have had something on there. To protect, yeah. Some kind of soft edge, surely. Yeah. And it was massive as well. It was a massive blade. Yeah. <laughs> After work, time for the love story. Marlon finds himself in Danny's mom's restaurant. Despite having driven by this place regularly, he's never stopped in before. He orders a beer and asks her to join him. And after she weighs that option for a very long moment, gives him a long look, she grabs a glass. Raya points out Danny can't really know if this is how it went down, but Danny says they told the kids this story all the time. It feels like they were there. Back in time, Marlon and his mom drink and talk and laugh all night long, and love is born. Danny admits even he thought Marlon was the man to keep the monsters out when he was a kid. But the truth is they didn't stand a chance. The monsters were already there. There's a montage of them at dinner holding hands, laughing in the car as Danny sits on Marlon's lap driving. Pure family joy. But the next scene you hear Danny's mom and Marlon having very loud sex and Danny coming out and their door is open so that he can watch the festivities too. She's not a very caring mom in that. Scene. That's literally the worst noise you can hear as a kid, I swear. Uh-huh. The worst fucking noise. And the door was open. Yeah, it's not just the noise. It's like... Oh, uh, it's awful. God, I know she was very kind of, you know, very casual with her son while changing when it was just the two of them. But, but this is way too far. Close the door if you're going to have sex. Yeah. Oh, I did not like that. That was horrifying. Blech. As a child of parents period like watching that and listening to that is just ugh. yes too much i i thought his his uh comment earlier about the monsters were already there we're, we're already there so like obviously at this point in time when he's talking to raya he knows that marlon was a monster himself but when he says the monsters were already there what is he referring to prior to marlon himself i think this is another one of those moments where i i read it as maybe the mom like mm. it's not as amazing as she seems but i have absolutely no reason to believe that it's just i just caught the same thing you did that the monsters were already there but kimberly did you just say himself that's probably more likely how he's what he means yeah i said himself mm-hmm. yeah i also think I, I also thought like he just meant that um that he's already has like quite a hard life at such a young age that yeah. his dad is not there his brother is also not there at the moment he's trouble at school with bullying and then he witnessed this bar fight and like right nothing's enough to yeah. fix all that you know mm-hmm. yeah i think in retrospect it is more likely he's talking about himself than his mom because he idolizes her but i'm like i do look forward to learning more about his relationship with his mom as we go because that is really shitty like bringing somebody home immediately and then obviously leaving the door open is excessively Mm -hmm. over the top not caring about your kid the least you can do is close the door right and be quiet come on you know i'm kind of like the whole show is basically well like not everything but like especially those flashbacks it's all denny's point of view right so did things actually go down that way or is it yeah that's a good question was it different and it's just how he like right. you know remembers it or or yeah and right that's what raya keeps pointing out to him um she questions his memories sometimes yes i question my own memories like memory is so unreliable totally there's this malcolm gladwell podcast i think talking about it and it's so fascinating how shitty our memories really are and how like we just make stuff up mm-hmm. <laughs> we're all unreliable narrators to our own yeah. past and our own memories right so yeah it's a valid point that you know and maybe he could hear them and in his in his memory yes. like he has 
an image of himself like seeing it because it was so loud he could practically vividly yeah like he could conjure images right so who knows maybe they did close the door yeah yeah he he heard weird noises he couldn't Mm -hmm. understand and even went and opened the door and then saw it yeah maybe yeah and it scarred him for life yeah he 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 left the house real quick the next morning (laughs) he was bolting out the door yeah there may have even been like a strangeness to that hallway shot where you see him watching them, like something that seemed almost distorted. Another thing is Marlon, I don't think he saw Danny, but he heard a noise out in the hallway. Danny made a noise and he yeah. turned. So he, it's like he's aware that Danny um, witnessed something. Oh, well, that's awful. Well, and then, yeah, but then it bugs me the next morning because they're both like clueless hey. about why Danny mm-hmm. is maybe acting off. And I'm like, what the like don't act clueless this is so obnoxious this makes it way worse to me that she wasn't like oh shit what if he saw blah 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 you yeah know? or heard like she knows how loud she was right instead like our behavior was fine like nothing out of the acceptable mm-hmm. yeah but then again this is this will happen right right it's exactly like, it's it's his point of view or was it like danny's memory okay and then after, you're right after this incident they, they they just went on with their lives and in the end maybe it wasn't exactly you know, no you're like, right it, so. it's like his his retelling of it is yeah. that everything was normal in the morning when and he left quickly but maybe they were more awkward than he's his memory of it so like we don't know if we will ever know <laughs> like, that's right it yeah. actually went down but i give a little bit of a benefit of the doubt it's worth questioning if yeah it's flashbacks that are like told by danny's point of view so we've kind of talked about this scene, but the next morning she's making breakfast. Marlon's impressed. She makes breakfast every morning. Danny comes out, awkward from last night, and excited to see Adam, who's back from London. So he runs out the door, and Adam is quick to stand up to bullies for him again. And also to tell Danny how much his dad missed him and talked about him while Adam was there. The same stuff we were hearing from Jack in the last episode. I was unclear on where Adam was coming from at first, but then in the next scene, we learned that their dad is just setting up a business in London and getting an apartment there. But it sounds like he still has one here. Mm. Yeah. And then in class, we see something else from the last episode. The London guy Danny was tearing up at the hotel was given to him by his dad, who was starting a travel agency in London. And he tells the class in show and tell that they're going to visit all the places in the book when he visits him. The teacher is extra complimentary to Danny. And another kid calls him a teacher's pet. And then as everybody's leaving, the teacher calls him out to stay after class. He shuts the door and tells him to take a seat. And I was immediately like creeped out by this. Definitely. Yeah. My heart was beating like so fast. I was like, oh my God. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. Yeah. It's awful. Awful. The teacher offers to be his special friend, tells him he's special and is reaching out to touch his face in an inappropriate way when the door opens and Marlon saves the day. Just what the doctor ordered, Danny says. Mm. Raya doesn't think it's so funny. (sighs) This is what made me think I was had the wrong impression about Marlon. Definitely. I was Mm. like, oh, is this the guy Mm -hmm. fucking weirdo? Like, and Marlon. Yeah. Yeah. He saved him. I was like, oh, the predator is someone else. It's not Marlon. Yeah. And he even looked concerned. Marlon looked like, and then he questions in the car, yeah. you know, the teacher's behavior. We pointed out earlier that this is the same guy who was in the principal's office with um, with Danny earlier. Yeah, mm-hmm. the guidance counselor. So he knows like, he knows about Danny's home life and I think yeah. that elevates Danny to target and Mm-hmm. And Danny doesn't have many people to turn to. He's just one mm-hmm. of these kids whose parents are pretty absent. No, and this is the guy at the school. This is like the therapist, right? Yeah. This yeah. is who the kids can't turn to if they need help with something like this. And obviously... It makes it just all the more... Horrifying, right. Gross and disturbing. Right. So he has nobody he can go to easily, you know? hmm I was also, like, super surprised when Adam just turned around to that kid and was like, choke on your own cock or whatever. <laughs> Things like that coming out of little little kids' mouths like crack me up for some reason. Yeah, you don't expect it. I was just like, whoa. Oh, Tom, Tom. Okay. The kids in this, uh, the kids were great in this episode. Yeah. yeah. Um, Zach Rollinger, I think, plays young Danny, and he's so good. He's very, very good. Do they have twins playing this these parts, or is it the same kid playing both? I think it is the same kid playing both parts. Oh. Yeah. He's amazing. I always feel bad, though, for kids having to do a scene like this, you know, like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's no way that's easy, even in acting. You definitely Mm -hmm. have 
an intimacy coordinator on set, obviously, to make sure this is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope so. No, they'd have to. I think it's in mandatory now that you have them on all set. Oh, okay. Every single set you need them, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's good. I hope it really yeah. helps. Because he just, like, he's doing two scenes back to back like this, you know? I think that having to do such a good job of conveying this disturbing, like, feelings that I think yeah. that it has to be very hard to film. Anyway, though, um, yeah, so Marlon saves the day and Adam's waiting in the car, tells Danny he got worried when he didn't come out. So Adam also saved Danny here because he's the one that sent Marlon in after him. And Marlon starts asking Danny about what was going on if he touched him. But Danny just shakes his head. Marlon moves on to a new topic. He's going to propose to Danny's mom. In case Danny has any hesitation on the topic, Marlon tells him he is not sure how she could even keep Danny if she doesn't marry him. He's willing to help her out, but first they have to make a secret pact. And he pulls the car over and it's just... uh... Immediately, my heart started beating so fast because you see that flash, you know, that like the driving to the right, the barn, the backyard that we've seen a few times. I was like, Mm. oh, fuck, something horrible is about to happen right now. Yeah. I was like, no. Oh, it's so awful. And like, what did you guys think about his line about not even sure how she could keep you? I mean, obviously, this is a tactic. This isn't true. Like, it's not like she's going to get rid of her kids. It's just, no, it's just a threat. I just didn't see the point of it. It does make sense to get them on board of him marrying her, but is it connected to what's what happens immediately after? It might be because like from what we saw, they got along really well before this initial thing happened. Like it seemed like he was getting along with Marlon like really well. Right. I don't know if that was just, yeah, like you said, like something bad's going to happen. But if I don't come into your life, you know, your mom's going to have to give you up. It just seemed like an extreme uh, threat to put out in Danny's mind, unless it's somehow connected to him abuse, his abuse as well. I mean, obviously Marlon's a evil man, but yeah. But what are the odds? I mean, this poor kid being um, pursued by two predators back to back in the same day. Mm, yeah. Wow. It's so fucked up. Like the world to this kid is such a horrible place. I hate thinking about like some people's experience in the world, mm-hmm. you know, is so different from mine. And it's just terrible, you know, everything that they've experienced. And I have heard of this. Some victims have said that it it wasn't just one person who abused them like there were multiple people so it's it's almost like they felt like there was something wrong with them and that what like yeah. what made me so vulnerable and then maybe and some kids like Danny who really don't have a lot of actual protection around them are just targets to and and predators know how to sniff them out it's really really awful mm-hmm. very sad in the interrogation grown-up Danny wants to stop now and Raya gently pushes him to continue tells him it's important and then we're back in the car uh Marlon tells Danny they're going to try something and he's going to like it and it's going to be their secret. And oh my God, poor Danny. Adam's in the car, but he's not being included in this. Marlon keeps calling for Danny, who looks back at Adam, but finally follows. And then they're at the barn that we've seen before in his flashes of Adam. Uh, He grabs his hand. He just wants to show him something. And then Adam runs out and tells him to take him instead, which enrages Marlon, who screams none of that bullshit like he's seen it before. But then all of a sudden, he's like, okay with it. And he takes Adam instead, leaving Danny behind. But yet another door is left open so that Danny can watch. And Raya asks, how long after that did they get married? He says a few months later, but the sexual abuse continued on because why stop? Marlon got away with it. She asks about their mom, but he tells her she never knew. But he does not say it convincingly, in my opinion. I'd venture from the way that he said it that he knows that she knew. I don't know if you guys, what you thought about that exchange. It's it's likely she had at least an instinct that she ignored. And that's that's where like the complacency can come in. But he calls Adam his savior. So this is like another reference to someone saving Danny. Yeah. Most important one, maybe even, I think. Yeah. That like Adam stepped in to get abuse instead of Danny. Mm-hmm. Or to protect him from bullies. Yeah, but compared to the bullies, so this is way way worse yeah Uh, right like the worst you can experience maybe yeah as a kid it's also interesting when he's like what's this got to do with ariana it's like what we were talking about earlier she's digging so deep into him and his life and it's just obviously strange because like we said he just he's saying obviously ariana shot open fire at rockefeller center and 
you know, that was it. No one died. You know, it's literally just someone shooting a gun. You wouldn't normally have someone interrogating or asking about your life and digging so deep into things like that. And your history, like, as a child, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. There's a lot of open doors. Like, it, yeah. it also struck me that, like, with the shed with Angelo was a very, like, similar scene to oh, God. this barn scene with the, you know, young Adam. Yeah, you're right. Uh, strange theme. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I was thinking about, um, you know, how we were saying our first introduction to Marlon earlier on in the juvenile detention center. We had a different impression of him. He seemed like a nicer guy. He seemed to be helping that kid. But now in retrospect, I'm like, well, that's like the perfect job for a predator. Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. he has like easy private access to all these young boys and it's just disgusting. Right. Just like the guidance counselor. Both of those guys are perfectly in that position. You know, they've gotten themselves into a position where they're around a ton of kids and nobody would probably trust the kids over the adults in the situation either so i feel mm-hmm. like for all of you parents like how do you ever trust sending your kids no. out to the world there's predators everywhere it's horrible yeah it is like terrifying yeah i also thought it was interesting moment when they flashed to the weird basement water thing was after raya that she goes what happened to adam and how did he die and immediately after they flashed to the water basement thing bro- broken down house yeah i think it might i think we might have sort of seen yeah, the guy that's like locked up onto the corner like the bearded dude okay but yeah it was an interesting moment to show that i thought yeah and the episode ends you know with him saying what does this have to do with ariana and then there's like a sad shot of young danny letting go of the firefly the lightning bug kind of like letting go of his childhood and it's really sad mm-hmm. I love that shot as well with all the fireflies. It's beautiful. I know. It's so pretty. Yeah. And we've seen that before. That that was another like flash that he's had before is, is young Danny with fireflies. And I mm-hmm. wondered, is, is that what Danny is doing while Adam and Marlon are in the, um, the barn? Probably. Playing with fireflies. I don't know if they were at the same time or if it was just like a, an, an image of like a rare image of innocence in Danny's young life like playing with fireflies maybe that's what it meant because he doesn't have a lot of that yeah maybe do you guys live places with fireflies because i don't yeah less though than we used to have but yes we do have fireflies i actually think that we've had a lot less in the past couple years and i think it might be because we spray for mosquitoes so i'm the asshole here (laughs) but we had really bad mosquitoes like one summer that were just like eating us alive so now we spray for mosquitoes and i've seen less than that just has occurred to me that uh, that might be correlated was it last week i looked up if we had fireflies here because i've never seen one but we do apparently oh they, do, they just hide from kimberly yeah. but also kimberly they're outside oh yeah i don't go outside you need water yeah i was just gonna say are they in more humid climates because i'm in the desert so i don't think i would have them here but the only time i've ever seen them is when i was visiting my family back east um who live in uh, maryland so they had him there and I was it was a wonder. I was like, these things are like magic. <laughs> Pretty cool, yeah. Do they bite you or are they just like No, they just light up and fly around and make things pretty. I don't know the science behind why they light up. But... Yeah, it's cool. All right. I think that's a wrap on our discussion of season one, episode five of the crowded room. Come back next Friday for our discussion of episode six. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.